Okay, thank you very much for your presence here today. It's very important for us to, to, to have the possibility to share some information about open source and business. I have a lot of questions, but uh, the topic today is how to create a successful software business thanks to open source. Um, I have a lot of questions, but be before I, I, I suggest to introduce yourself, your track record, and maybe your last job company, I, I suggest to begin by you, uh, Amandine. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I'm Amandine, and I work for a company called New Vector, and uh, also work for an open source project, which is called Matrix. Uh, we do secure and decentralized communications, basically trying to provide alternatives to WhatsApp and Slack in a way that you can actually control. So, you, as a user, you want to control who is actually owning your conversation and make sure that you know where it goes and what happens to it. So we're trying to provide this layer on top of the web for, um, for real-time co communication. Um, so Matrix started as an open source project, which def uh, it defines the protocol, the technology, uh, allowing us to do this. And New Vector is the for-profit company which has been set up on the side to actually hire the Matrix team and provide apps and services on top of Matrix. OK, thank you. Uh, maybe, uh, Fabien, you can carry on. Hi everyone, uh, so I'm Fabien Potencier. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I created a company called Senseo 20 years ago. It was a web agency, kind of the same story as Magento. So we started by building websites for customers and at some point we realized that we wanted to um, automate some of the things we were doing for our customers and we decided to look for a framework in the PHP world. Uh, it was when PHP 5 was about to be released and we decided to create our own framework. It was actually a fork as well uh, from a framework uh, that was uh, kind of good, and we decided to add more layers on top of what um, uh, this framework was about, and uh, we decided to release the framework as an open source project uh, six months after starting the project in 2005, and uh, since then we have you know, built a kind of a community uh, around the framework. It's used by many people. So a framework is kind of the um, uh, low-level architecture of a website, so you can build whatever you want with uh, Symfony, actually. Um, and uh, nowadays, I'm working for several different companies. Uh, one of them is called Symfony, which is uh, a company around uh, the framework itself, and we are trying to find a way to uh, monetize uh, open source, which is really hard, I can tell you. Um, and I have another company called uh, Blackfire, which is um, very technical, so I'm not going to dig into the details here. And of course, still involved with Sensualize, which is the company I created uh, with uh, Greg here um, uh, 20 years ago. Thank you, Fabien. Ziv, maybe? Hi, uh, my name is uh, Zev Suaski. Uh, my main claim to fame, I guess, so far, uh, has been the involvement in the creation of PHP 20 plus years ago. Um, I got involved with open source as a student, um, initially for a very short period of time as a user of PHP, a uh, version 2 that existed back then, and then very quickly creating a new version that um, uh, we didn't realize it at the time, but it was to become PHP version 3, um, that radically boosted the popularity of this language. Um, more than two years later, I co-founded a company named Zend, to provide commercial backing to PHP. PHP, uh, the choice of open source wasn't really, I would say, um, intentional. It was obvious for us at the time that it had to be open source, both because the uh, version two was open source and uh, because of the um, environment we were operating at the uh, university, it was just obvious that uh, we had to uh, go with an open source uh, approach as opposed to creating uh, a commercial company. We didn't really have any plans at the time. Only, like I said, a couple of years later, we um, saw the huge growth uh, of, of PHP, of the usage, and uh, we actually had um, started receiving all sorts of requests for value-add products on, around PHP from companies who started using it. So essentially, only that at that point in time, we thought ourselves that we should uh, create a company to provide some commercial backing for this language, and uh, that was um, Zend that uh, we created back then. Um, 
today, I, I left Zend about half a year ago after spending almost 20 years, just under 20 years in the company. And I'm now with a, a new startup that we haven't gone uh, public about it yet, so I can't say the name, but we're in the uh, hosting business of open source applications. Okay, thank you, Ziv. Maybe so, you are very quickly because yeah. I hope now every, every guy here know you are. So, uh, yeah, hopefully the people were listening before, but uh, my name is Joachim Kuttner, and um, I do want to say that um, out of these uh, three people sitting to my right, I owe my career to two of them. Uh, so we actually use PHP a lot and everything I did so far. And maybe we can organize a room table about PHP. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so definitely Zev and his company, we were using uh, PHP and everything we're doing. And then with Magento, we were using Zen Framework. So again, thank you for that. And today with Oro, I use, uh, we use uh, Symfony. And again, Fabian is uh, responsible for that. So again, really um, an honor for me to sit and share the, ta the stage with these people. Uh, just quickly about Oro, because I didn't talk about it. Somebody removed the slide, I guess. Uh, so in Oro, we actually have three uh, open source projects today on the market. Uh, one is Oro CRM, which is uh, our take on what the modern CRM should look like, which is a multi-channel environment where you can really collect all the interactions with the customer in a central repository for your company and have different people in the company access it, like salespeople, marketers, etc. And then uh, our next product is uh, Oro Commerce, which is our take on what B2B companies need in order to really take the plunge and move digital and online when it comes to B2B selling to other companies. And of course, we are contributing to the open source with what we call the Oro platform, which is a uh, general purpose business application platform doesn't have any business domain in it, but it has a lot of features that every business application needs. We're releasing it under the MIT license. We really want people to disrupt a lot of the industries and uh, different business applications. And some companies use it for themselves, but there are projects that are using it already for new uh, projects, um, like uh, Akinio that I mentioned earlier, and Morello, which is from uh, uh, a company from the uh, Netherlands that created an open source uh, uh, ERP on top of our platform. So that's what I'm doing today, and I'm uh, happy to be here. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a lot of questions, but uh, maybe we can begin with uh, Fabien. And if you want, if you have another point of view, uh, you can talk, take the microphone. Uh, don't hesitate to do that. Um, Fabien, the first question, do you agree that the choice of open source is not only a question of business, but that values and proudness are also a key of the uh, question? Um, so so when, when you're talking about choosing an open source project, you're, you're talking about uh, a company open sourcing something or a company uh, selecting an open source software for his business. No, you as an entrepreneur, when you want to build an open source company, mm -hmm. is not only a question of business, it's also a part of proudness, of values, because we want okay. to engage to open yeah. source. Yeah, so, so the, fir the very first thing I want to talk about is the fact that uh, when we are talking about open source, it's not just about the code. Mm. Right? And of course, if you don't have code, you don't have an open source project. But if you only have code, you don't have an open source project. So the license is not, uh, is not a goal. So it's great to have uh, a piece of software license under the MIT or GPL or whatever open source license. But if you don't have more than that, that doesn't work. So the first thing you need to have is uh, documentation. Right? If people are not able to use your software, that doesn't work. So, and and that's, that's a lot of work. Um, and we had someone talking about um, uh, open sourcing some of the stuff and, and trying to figure out how to build a community around that. And I think that's really complex. It, and I think it's much more complex nowadays than it was 20 years ago or 15 years ago when I started Symfony. Back then, you know, it, it was about, GitHub was not even there. So it was very difficult to contribute to open source. It was more difficult to actually open source something. Nowadays, I think literally hundreds of new open source software are created every single day. So you need to find a way to stand out. And that's where you need to find a way to be, um, um, to have good quality of the code, good documentation, good onboarding process. Uh, but more than that, you also need to take care about diversity, uh, about a lot of different uh, topics that uh, 
they were not even um, a topic uh, 15 years ago. Mm. Um, and if you don't have a community, and if you are not able to build a community, uh, then you don't have an open source project. Yes, yes. You have, we, we, we can imagine um, when you are uh, an entrepreneur and you want to build an open source company, you can have a vacation of license, you can have a vacation of community, but you are like a guru. It's like it's very proud to, to be at the top of a community, no? Um, so I, I'll say this, as an entrepreneur, we want to build companies. And uh, the fact that we choose open source is because it's a strategy that we believe uh -huh. that the company will be more successful using open source. So um, I don't think that anybody goes and creates an open source project and says, it's for my uh, ego. And no, I want no, no. You I think? Think? We have quite a different angle on that because our, when we started Matrix, the goal was really to actually disrupt the industry. And we really started from the open source side of things. And actually we started, we were incubating in a big company uh, called Amdocs. And uh, we were a pure R&D project for three years where only thing we were doing is building this open source project, building the community, etc. And then at some point uh, we were okay, uh, we, Amdocs was starting to see their competitor build products on top of Matrix. They were saying, well, why are we the only ones paying the bill for this thing if others are making money on top of it? So we say, okay, let's spin out. And that's when we actually set up the company and say, okay, how now can we make money on top of the project and actually um, uh, find business models which allow us to grow the project? So it's um, the interesting bit is that the whole company is very mission-driven uh, and everyone we hire is very mission driven and the goal and it's baked into new vectors uh, values is that we want to grow the matrix ecosystem so it's the best the most open license uh, we use apache license because it's very open because we want people to build uh, companies and services on top of matrix but we also have to find ways for ourselves to actually be able to hire the team and uh, like so that we can contribute further to the project hmm. Thank you. Uh, Ziv, uh, an evocation about the, the community in open source project. The community is key. We need to have a large, broad adoption. Yeah, I mean, it, it very much relates to what Fabian said. Uh, I think that um, having code that is open is uh -huh. kind of it's a requirement. It's a key ingredient of having an open source project, but it's definitely not enough. Without a community, I would say that this is probably the second ingredient, arguably the first ingredient, uh, but equally important to having um, a, a good project is the availability of a community. And the community has a lot of different facets. It, it's um, both folks who are using this and exchanging ideas and exchanging solutions around your uh, project, but also if you're the only a uh, company that has developers that are contrib contributing to the open source project and you don't have contributions from the outside, it's typically not very sustainable. Uh, it, it can work in the initial stage of kind of seeding the project, but if, uh, if you're the only one that's developing it, it's very difficult, not impossible, but very, very difficult to um, sustain this project and keep the level of interest. Uh, ultimately, having contributions from the outside um, is uh, both necessary and also it's a, it's a good indicator that the community is growing. Um, but, but maybe you can carry on. What is the role of the community? Testing? <coughs> contributing? It's it's either of the above. If if I look at the PHP uh, the PHP ecosystem, it, it's all over the place. We have people mo most of the people who are developing the code today of PHP itself are not on the payroll of um, of, of Zend or um, and many of them are not on the payroll of any company. They're just contributing because the, this is something that they like to do, um, and, and that, so that's a development of PHP itself. But uh, on top of that, there's people who write uh, documentation. There are, there are people who write tests. The people who are using PHP and exchanging ideas, exchanging, um, ex exchanging source code, so for that matter, Symfony, and Oro, and Magento, and all of these open source projects, uh, WordPress, Drupal, all of those huge ecosystems in their own right, they're part of the PHP ecosystem, that, and they are one of the key reasons that PHP continues to be popular mm. and, and to go. A lot of people today choose PHP 
not because they choose the language PHP, but because they chose a project that happens to be implemented in PHP, and by that, they kind of dive into this uh, language uh, mm. uh, as a second day uh, choice. Yes, Fabian, do you, do you agree with that? Uh, it's a hard question, but do you think sometimes it's a bit hard to work with uh, your community, no? Yes. Hard. No. Hard question. Joker? <laughs> no, 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 no. I think it's, it's, you know, working with people from all around the world, different cultures, uh, different languages, uh, different assumptions, uh, different goals, that's very difficult, that's for sure. Um, you talked about being a guru before. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not one for Symfony, but I know that at some point you need people able to decide things. You need someone able to say yes or no. This is the direction we want to take, or no, that's not the direction of the project. If you want to fork, be my guest. Uh, the problem is not forking the code. That's easy. There is one button on GitHub to do that. Very easy. The thing is, you need to fork the community, and that's very hard. So you really need to mess up with your community so that there is a fork that is very successful. Uh, I'm not aware of, of I, I, actually, I'm aware of one successful uh, fork uh, in, the, in the PHP industry, which is uh, Joomla, which was a fork of Mumble. Um, so working with the community is really hard, um, uh, and, but that's also the key to the success of, of a project. And when we're talking about a community, that's, also, that's about the users, that's about the contributors, but you know, just reporting a bug is important. Writing a blog post is important as well. So it's everything that you know you can do to um, uh, talk about the project, about the brand. Because when we're talking about the project, we're also talking about, about the brand. We're talking about PHP. We are talking about Oro, about uh. Magento, about Drupal, about Symfony. So we are talking about brands, mm. and the brands are not open source. Uh, that's also a key difference between you can fork the code, you can't use PHP for a new project. That's not possible. You, you have how to find a balance between makers and takers. I, I know sometimes it's very hard to, to, to see um, your product forked by other company outside of a company. How is very how to find the balance? So it's uh, um, it's very hard. But again, I just join everything that was said here. If if you are the company that's leading, uh, uh -huh. and again, we are um, unlike some of these projects here. We are um, a company, so unlike PHP, I'll say that we were a company, a commercial company with a commercial uh, idea. Um, we used open source as a strategy. So we actually, unlike many here, like I mentioned in my talk, we were responsible for the core product. We were investing millions of dollars in, in developing it because we were a commercial uh, company. And the idea for us to, d to distribute it on the open source was more of a marketing decision than anything else. Again, early on, we learned that contribution in a commercial environment does not work for us. Uh, but to create an ecosystem, to spread the word, to uh, create this uh, awareness of our product, that's why we used open source. And I'll say we, we really identified the need for ourselves, and that's what we used to kind of create and build, and people started using. And we, we went, unlike you guys, where you go, I'll say, uh, top up, where you have developers, and then you start uh, generating uh, uh, kind of an ecosystem. We had uh, merchants that wanted us, and they started looking for developers. And developers said, well, if I have a potential to do some work here, I'll learn Magento, and I'll start building on top of that. So we really went the other way around. We actually utilized open source. So again, I, like I said, I really thank everybody that did all that. But we were a commercial company. So the balance for us was very easy. Every time somebody tried to fork us, we were so much moving faster than them and uh, that they were we would use them as uh, instruct, instructions to us, what we did wrong, why, how we can learn from them, and actually use their work to incorporate it back into our product. So we were, we never, like in a different scenario with the community, but in the commercial idea, because we had already a commercial company behind that, we continuously invested in it and moved so much faster than anybody that tried to fork us. So a fork was almost uh, obsolete by the time they released something. Yes, uh, uh, Modi, do, do you agree with that? Because uh, it can be right when you are a big company, but at the beginning of a story, it, yeah, it can be a bit complex. No. Um, so in terms of makers versus takers, yeah, we've seen some people actually take matrix and build their uh, integrate it to their property st stuff and never contribute anything back. Ooh. And uh, on one hand, yeah, it's a bit disappointing, really. Like, uh, come on, guys, you were invested a lot. You're not helping us here. You're not ma helping things, making things better. On the other hand, um, I completely agree. We move much faster than them, and we have complete control. 
And uh, the, in terms of the differentiation of the, having a community, there are some people who actually open source the software just for the differentiator and be able to put the open source label on top of it and they just leave it here. So it's been developed as a closed, so a closed software. So it's not necessarily you were talking about, it forces us to make amazing sauce. Oh no, it was the, um, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot his name from my, if I think. It forces us to do beautiful software and you're under scrutiny. So some people just take the software and leave it here and let it die. Not let it die, but it's just, ah, oh, it's open source. If you have a community, it's a validation. It proves that your software is good. It's helping us. It's keeping you honest on what you're doing on the, on the plus side and uh, is the mar whole market marketing and branding uh, side of things as well. People talk about you, you become visible, and they want to build stuff on top of your software. And it was really interesting to see how you come from, as you say, from top to bottom and say, oh, we have tons of developer, we have to do something with it, we'll have to restrict the access to the code, uh, like the commit for the core team, and you can get, you guys can build stuff around it. And yeah, it's, we ended up in the same conclusion, but from <laughs> the bottom up. Okay, thank you. Um, now I want to switch to business model. Um, you talked just uh, before about uh, the strategy at the beginning of the, uh, the company. Open source is also a question of a strategy. We talk a lot about uh, the five main open source business model. Support, hosting, uh, restrictive licensing, open core, hybrid licensing. What is the best way to build a sustainable uh, company, open source company? We want to, to, to talk about that. Um, I'm not sure there is a best way. I think it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, on our side, as I say, we want an, uh, to build an open ecosystem where anyone can go and build businesses on top of. So uh, what we've done, so our, our goal is really to build a SaaS business. We want, we have servers that anyone can go and run like an email server, but honestly, who runs their email server? It's a bit of a pain. So you want to find someone where you just uh, set up a server from them and they run it for you. So that's what we want to do. Uh, the thing is, we had an unexpected product market fit with uh, governments and big company, and uh, the French government is using Matrix to communicate internally. And that forces us towards professional services and consulting and helping these big companies actually deploy. So we have a, a bit of a dual business model where on one side uh, we provide consulting and professional services and on the, the other we also provide hosting. In terms of licensing, um, if we want people to build on top of it, we had to provide a super, um, uh, very permissive license, uh, as I was saying earlier. So, so for you, Amandine, I understand the best way is to have professional services and hosting, but in your case, how you, do you agree with that? Uh, so I do agree that it very much depends on the product uh -huh. you're building and the industry that you're building it for and but what the product is supposed to do. So Yes. Uh, do you advise for uh, any guy here who want to, to, to build an open source company? how to depend, how to choose the, the best business model. Yeah, so uh, again, I can just talk from my experience in our industry when we are talking about uh, enterprise uh, software, uh, the dual licensing model is the one that works the best uh, because the rest of them is uh, either we compete with the ecosystem, you, know, you can talk about cloud a bit differently today, but with the Magento use case, uh, we had a lot of uh, big part of our ecosystem were hosting companies, right, that were specializing in hosting uh, PHP and uh, Zen framework. And um, if we, when we try to kind of compete with them, we started hurting them and fighting them. So we really went with dual licensing. It actually came, funny enough, it came from our customers. They asked for it because uh, we had the big company called Xerox, I don't know if you heard of them, uh, that wanted to use Magento and they asked us how much and we said nothing, it's open source. You, you know, you can buy support if you want, but they said, no, no, we can't enter zero price tag for software in our system, in our accounting system. So we put a price and then we saw that that works. And it really was the model that scaled our business. I mean, um, the rest were not scalable. So it really depends what kind of company you want to build, if what kind of scale you want the company to become. But the one that scaled for us was dual licensing. Companies that were interested in having a throw to choke, uh, had some warranties, uh, identification on the software, et cetera, they wanted to pay us for the software and, got, and get this different license on top of the open source one. Um, and that really went, it changed the whole uh, structure of the company. We, from a services company, we became product company selling software, so mm. that's it really worked. Uh, Ziv, maybe you can carry on. For you, uh, with your company Zend, what was the business model? 
So I, I guess you would call it kind of retroactively an open core uh, model. Uh, it's not quite that, but it's kind of close enough. We um, sold proprietary value add uh, on top of PHP, which uh, PHP is kind of difficult to call it open core because it's a, a project in its own right with a lot of contributions outside of uh, Zen. I mean, the majority was actually at some point in the, coming from outside of Zen. Um, I can say that while I agree uh, that uh, it depends, I think that this is one of the more difficult uh, business models to monetize. Um, I think that if we look today at the successful uh, companies that uh, have been employing open source, I would say, arguably, I can't, we can't really call it an open source company, but probably Amazon is the company that makes the most amount of money out of open source today, even though historically they haven't contributed that much to open source at all. But providing services, providing hosting for that matter, um, they're making literally many, many uh, billions out of it using software that, for the most part, they didn't try. Um, that is also uh, a, a very common business model, I think, for a lot of the kinds of open source projects like it, like Redis and, and so on. They also go with the, the, that approach. They're not quite as big as Amazon, but I think it's generally a good business model. I would say that um, uh, if you're getting started, I would definitely uh, look into the dual licensing option. But it's a bit of a chicken and egg. I mean, I think the first ingredient you need to have uh, in order to have a successful pro uh, open source project is to have a successful project. Mm. Uh, if you kind of think about what, how I'm going to monetize it at step zero, uh, before you even have a successful project, it may, uh, you know, you may have the best recipe yeah. for commercial success, but yeah. without actually a successful project, you can't really uh, get yeah. the. Yes, oh, it's, it's, it's right, but maybe Fabien, I, I can imagine it's a bit more complex to uh, earn money with uh, a product like uh, a framework, like uh, an e-commerce software, no? Yeah, probably yes. <laughs> <laughs> Much more difficult. Um, I'm not sure what is the best uh, business model. I know the worst. That support. Never, ever go down that path. That doesn't work. If you ask people, they are going to tell you, yes, I want some support. And then you say, okay, you can sign here and you can pay for that. Ah, oh, no, 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 I'm going to pay if I need that. That does not work. It's not how it works. So never do that. That doesn't work. First, then it doesn't scale. So you need to find a business model that scales. If we are talking about open source, we are talking about a software is going to be used by millions of people, hopefully, anywhere in the world. So you need to find something that scales anywhere in the world. Uh, so anything related to you know, a SaaS model works quite well, if that's possible. I agree that you don't need to think about the business model if you don't have a community, but at the same time, it's very difficult to add a business model on top of something. You know, when we started Symfony, we didn't think about having a business model. It was just something kind of a marketing for us, saying, okay, we are a web agency, we have this framework, it is well known, we are the creator of the framework, so we can help you build your project. And then at some point, we realized that we were uh, uh, you know, um, investing millions of, of, of euros uh, into the software, and we needed to find a way to actually monetize the software. It's, it's very difficult, because at some point, you are saying to your community, we've been you know, giving you something for free for so many years, and now we need to find a way to monetize the, the, the framework. But the reality is that it's not free. People are working. On the, on, on the framework or any open source project. Um, and even if they're doing that in their free time, they're not doing anything else, right? So that's, that's time is money. So at some point, you need to find a way to monetize your, your open source software somehow. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe the last word for Hamandin. If you can share with us your advice, if, you, if I want to launch a new open source company, only one advice. Well, I think on our side, um, our advice would really be that uh, to find people who understand the mission. Uh, if you're trying to build something big uh, and use the open because that's how you're going to get big and people and both uh, employees and investors, if you get investors who understand that the bigger the ecosystem, the more money there is to be made. So, and not try to say like, 
let's lock everything down to um, a silo or proprietary thing because then you're limited in what you can do. So that's probably the most important thing, at least from our angle. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for this room table. I think we can applaud.